in Genesis this morning is one of those, one of the things that is a progenitor, that is something that begins, that makes those three souls. They're so important, this passage that we read is so important, that Paul, in chapter 6 of Romans, references this chapter as to how Jesus becomes our Savior because Jesus stands in the tradition of Abraham where his faith, as it tells us today, is reckoned as righteousness. Righteousness is reckoned for the equivalent of salvation. Abraham, if we start back at the beginning, is living in the territory of the city of Herod, which is in southern Turkey today. Still there. Doesn't look like it did when Abraham was there. And he and his family were leaseholders. Everybody knows what it is to have a lease, you know. You rent a piece of land. They pay a fee every year to be able to live in the environment of Herod and to grow crops and to graze their animals. And it was negotiated every year with the local king what it was going to cost them. They did not own where they lived. And if the king decided that somebody else would give him a better price than they would, he would take his soldiers and move them out and bring those other people in. And so when God first calls Abraham, he tells him, follow me and I will give you an heir because he had no children. I will give you land because he has no land. And I will bless those who bless you and curse those who curse you. And through you, I will bless the whole world. And Eric and Eric. And Abraham believed God and he gathers up his wife and his servants and his sheep and his goats. And now I know at some point in your life in church, you've seen a picture of Abraham getting his camels together. I'm sorry, when Abraham lived, camels were not tame beasts. They were still wild out in the desert and nobody rode them. They had donkeys gathered his donkeys to carry the burdens, and they traveled in stages from Haran down across what is today Turkey, and then they turned left. Let's see if I can get all this right. Went through Lebanon, Syria, Israel, and they stopped when they were in modern day. Eventually, of course, they would wind up in Egypt, but that's a different story. But Abraham never owned land except for a grave or a tomb. He was able to negotiate with some of the local folks where he was living to buy a tomb in Bachpelet, and that's where he buried Sarah when she died, and that's where he was buried when he died. But he lived for the promise. And one of the promises is an heir. In chapter 15 today, we get this conversation between God and Abraham. Abraham is gone to bed, he falls asleep, and he has a vision. And God appears to him and says, I'm here. I'm your great reward. And Abraham pipes up and says, what reward are you? You promised me land, I don't got it. You promised me a child, I don't got it. You know, Eliezer of Damascus, a slave in my camp, will be my heir. And God promises, says, no, you will have a child from you and Sarah, and that will be your heir. And Abraham says, you haven't done it now, by now. What makes you think you can do it now? God escorts him out of the tent and tells him, look up in the sky. Count the stars if you can. Now, I don't know how many stars are up there. I would start with a billion and then maybe start counting from there. There could be a trillion, you know? We think numbers like that, boy, that, I hear that, it doesn't mean anything. So we we'll try to do it a little better. Everybody can probably figure out how much a million is. You know? 
Well, a billion is 1,000 million. And a trillion is 1,000 billion. Now, that just fair boggles the mind, I tell you the truth. We start talking about billions of dollars, we're talking about thousands of millions of dollars. My goodness, where did it all come from? And God says to Abraham, Look up in the sky and look at the stars. And you know, of course, it's not like when we live today where, you know, we have all these lights and kind of make it hard to see the night sky sometimes. He's there out in the middle of nowhere and he's looking up and the stars are just there everywhere. Billions of them. Every time I read this, I want to think to myself, well, where do you look to find the first star to count with? And how do you keep going back to that to know you're counting in the right direction? I don't know. I guess if you're in the right place, you can find the North Star and start with it. You start going that way, and then you can't go that way anymore. Then you go that way, and then you go that way and that way. And I still don't know how you count all those stars. Because I don't think you can. And Abram knows he can't count that. You know, he probably, you know, if he's got 40 head through, you know, four times on both hands. Yeah. We don't laugh, but, you know, he didn't have a calculator. You know, if I got to do math, I had to pull my phone out and go to my calculator app, and sometimes I still don't get it right. I was doing that the other day. I was trying to figure out. I had gone and done my morning walk, and I was coming back trying to figure out how wide my pace was for the length of time I'd walk and anyway, and I kept getting, you know, like two inches and I'm going, something's wrong here. And then I realized that I had better multiplied the number of miles by the number of feet, but then we got the number of feet multiplied by the number of inches to find out what my stride was. This stuff's hard. <laughs> Well, maybe not for some people. Yeah. Every, every time I start doing math, we have to be formally introduced once again. But Abram looks up into the night sky and it tells us Abram believes God. Abram has faith in God's word and God reckons that faith and righteousness. This passage today is the grounding event to the Lutheran understanding that we are saved by faith and not by works. We are saved by what we believe and how we live that belief out. Because it doesn't do you any good to believe something if you don't, if it doesn't shape how you live. That, I don't understand that either. I'll be honest with you. I don't understand how you can say, I believe this and then go out and behave completely different. Because I think, I'm, I'm going to say, how you behave is what you really believe. You know, there, there's a famous Lutheran theologian whose name escapes me, and I tried to think of it last night and couldn't figure it out. But I, you can call them, you can go home and get on your phone and look up the book called The Courage to Be. T O B D, two words. And it'll tell you who wrote that. And because uh, I forgot to do that this morning. But in that book, he says, and, and I think this is really true, he says, whatever is the most important thing in your life is your God. And there's a lot of people who look at me and say, well, God's supposed to be your God. But it's not really. I play a lot of golf, but it's not more important than us. It's just more important. Mostly. Well, you know, I got feet to play all the way to the new. But Paul takes this event in Romans and builds on it to the importance of faith and leads Luther to, well, maybe you don't know this, Luther was in hiding at one point in his life after 
not after he had gone to the uh, Diet of Worms, it, they, over in Germany, as they burned, it was the Diet of Worms, where he had stood in front of Charles V, who was the Holy Roman Emperor, and challenged to defend his work where he stand there and said, unless you can show me my clear reading in scripture that I've written something wrong, I stand by what I've written. I so help me God, I can do nothing less. On his way back, though, even though he had a safe conduct path, he was kidnapped by his protector, Frederick the Elector, and taken to Wartburg Castle and put in incognito as Knight George. And while he's there, hidden away from his opponents, and in studying the Book of Romans, he has this enlightening moment where he says, it's scripture, it's grace, it's faith. Everything else doesn't count. Now, Luther would be the first one to tell you, it's not wrong to do good deeds. It's a good thing to do good deeds, and we ought to do good deeds. I myself, personally, am a great believer in random acts of kindness, you know. See somebody at the door that needs help getting something off the top shelf and get it off the floor, makes their day better. I don't take any particular credit for it, but it, it's, it's one small step in making the world a better place. So if I'm in the store and you see me one day you need something off the top shelf, you know I'll get it for you. We're glad to be. But you know, one of my favorite words when we run across this, some of our members every once in a while we figure out how we're going to do stuff. Luke had an anti a D I A P H O R A. What it means is things you can do, but you don't have to do. It's a lot easier to say A after you say things you can do, and other things you don't have to do all the time. But some of the stuff we do in church is A after. Things we can do, but not things we have to do. And that's okay. Some of that stuff that's A after, things that we do that we don't have to, can be very meaningful things. But it's not the basis of our faith, it's an outgrowth of our faith. And that's the lesson that we get today in Genesis. And it carries over into the Hebrew passage. And it carries over into Luke where Jesus is talking about leading a faithful life. Now he didn't really expect everybody on the planet Earth to all of a sudden go and sell everything they had and start giving away the poor and stuff like that because, you know, I, I couldn't remember when I was in college. There was one of these, what I call kooky crazy religious groups, out in New Mexico or Texas or somewhere like that. And their, their guru or leader of ever was told that on a certain day, uh, the world was going to end and they needed to be up on this hill so God could take them up into heaven like all the rest of us. Well, I had a bad day. So they sold their houses, they closed their bank accounts, they gave all their money away and went up on the hilltop. Woke up the next morning and had to resume their lives. They quit their job and give everything away. I would have hated to have been those people that woke up that morning and they were still here. That's a true story, by the way. That really happened. You can't beat true stories. They're always better than ones you make up. Gift of Abraham isn't so much that he will eventually will have a son named Isaac, who will have a son named Jacob, who will have 12 sons, who will give us Moses and Aaron, and who will give us Jesus. <coughs> but it's this incredible, startling confession of faith. Where our faith in a God who loves, a God who promises, a God who carries his promises out. And as we live in him through Jesus, we will be saved. It's in the Bible. It's 
grace 